And we're live. Hello, everybody. My name is Olivier Combe, and I'm your host today uh, for our awesome Angular Air show on reactive programming with uh, Matthew Podbisovsky. Say hi. <laughs> you got it. Good enough. Hi. <laughs> and Amy Knight. Hello. And Patrick GS. Hi, guys. <laughs> hi. So um, today we, we will be talking about reactive programming and RHGS, uh, which has been developed by Matthew. And before we start, let's make a quick announcement. Next week is um, an UI router with uh, Chris Tillen and Nate Habel. Uh, we still have to put it on the website, but um, it should be done by the end of the day or maybe tomorrow if we have the time. And don't forget to ask questions on uh, Twitter with the hashtag um, NGR question. Uh, we will answer them at the end of the show if we have the time, but we usually have. And, um, and we can start. So, Matthew, I'll let you make your own presentation. Uh, tell us who you are okay. and what you do. OK. Uh, well, I am a uh, principal SDE at, uh, at uh, that small company called Microsoft. And I am uh, um, a self-described uh, open sourcer, hence uh, the, the nifty little hat uh, that I picked up at Party City. Um, and so I, I've been at Microsoft for, for a good number of years and um, started out working with the, uh, the cloud programmability team way back when on, on Rx, uh, JS uh, back in the 2009-2010 time frame. And uh, from there, I've worked on, uh, I've, I've been involved with any number of efforts, whether it's you know, bringing reactive to, uh, to a much larger uh, uh, much, much larger, much grander scale, as well as as working on uh, for different languages, as we've found that um, Rx has been kind of a paradigm that fits across many languages because many languages have the same exact problems of of asynchronous and uh, um, and uh, event-based concurrency problems. So we, we found it's it's just been kind of a natural fit. We started uh, way back when in, in in the .NET land, and the reason why is that we were uh, this is gosh 2006 2007 before I joined the team. But the idea was. Uh, this is in in the time frame of when JavaScript, when you know jQuery was still kind of a new thing, and and uh, as well as Dojo and others. But what we were trying to do is because we realized that programming in JavaScript was pretty terrible back then. Uh, we wanted a, a, a way of programming in such a way that you could write your application in C sharp, hit a compile button, and then suddenly JavaScript will will uh, will suddenly spit out on the other side. Uh, but given the fact of the nature of, of JavaScript being single-threaded and callbacks and events everywhere, obviously the C-sharp events just wouldn't do uh, because you can't really marshal a multicast delegate across, a, uh, across the wire. It's a callback, as it were. Uh, so how do, we to, how do we kind of fix that? Well, we kind of fix that by... Uh, Creating this uh, this link to events or this I observable, and basically taking a gang of four pattern of the subject observer pattern, and realizing that it was kind of like what people were already doing with link uh, link to objects. So we created link to events, and then suddenly write, oh, well now we have a first class object which represents events. Now we can stream those across the wire very very easily, and then suddenly. Uh, suddenly you're able to do a lot more uh, very, very interesting uh, combinations of things. So that went on uh, for a while, and then we got, kind of got killed politically in terms of you know, going against Silverlight and other things just to be able to you know, point click and, and deliver to a different platform. Uh, so there are certain things that we got out of it, though, and that link to events, which, which became Rx, 
uh, suddenly we found very, very interesting because not only were we writing it for .NET, obviously, uh, where we could uh, compile down to the, the, the plain old IL, but uh, the RxJS aspect of it is that we now could codify what we did in, in, the, in the .NET land and then write it completely in native JavaScript and, and have the same kind of semantics on both sides. So that was really the, the driving factor. It was more of an accidental discovery than of, oh my gosh, we need to, 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 you know, to fix the way people to uh, think about asynchronous programming. It wasn't really our intent, but suddenly it was this, this kind of ah uh, moment where you're like, well, this is really kind of handy. And so, you know, starting back in 2010, uh, that's when we really started, you know, really working on this hard. But it really wasn't anywhere useful until about 2012. And then we open sourced everything, and 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 the world was great because we open sourced link to events, uh, link to objects, IL to JS. We basically took everything that we had from the from the Volta project and just basically dumped it out onto uh, out onto GitHub, including you know some of our experimentations on Objective C and various other uh, languages and RxCPP, us uh, RxC plus plus whatever. Uh, which kind of takes us to today, and, and, and it's kind of amazing when you think about it, is we started this journey five years ago, uh, five, six years ago, you know, in terms of the JavaScript world, and we're really just starting to get attention and traction now. Uh, and, and maybe why is, is that, it, it's a good question of maybe why is, is because we're realizing that you know as we're starting to to develop more on the on the uh, client itself, we're realizing that those those pain points are pretty painful of of dealing with uh, with callbacks, dealing with events, dealing with promises, and any other asynchronous mechanism. Uh, it gets pretty painful pretty quickly. Uh, in terms of race conditions and everything else, so that's kind of where where we are. And I also work on on some lots of other things. Uh, you know, I worked on things like uh, the Microsoft effort to to help uh, uh, Node work on Windows. I've been involved in uh, the Internet of Things uh, with uh, with the Tali project most recently as well, uh, doing uh, peer to uh, basically building a peer to peer. Uh, framework that can run pretty much anywhere over any mechanism, whether it's uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, etc., without you know requiring the internet. So that's kind of who I am and uh, kind of my journey of of how I got here. Wow, well, lots of interesting stuff that you're working on. Um, so let's uh, jump into reactive programming. Uh, sure. I think that it's uh, something that was invented a while back um, in the 70s maybe or earlier. Mm -hmm. um, how come uh, it's it's now becoming mainstream? Do you do you have any idea why? Is it because of um, promises and stuff like that that have kind of opened the way? That's, yeah, I, I think that certainly has something to do with it. I mean, Gerard uh, uh, Barry back in the, 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 the mid-80s really came up with the, the term reactive programming. Uh, and that was a real-time computing language that he was basically writing for his particular paper. So that was the, you know, the first time reactive programming really became a thing. I mean, uh, people... You know, obviously Leslie Lamport and others were talking about you know the, this this notion of of reactive programming because if you're having distributed programming and so forth, uh, you know you obviously have to wait for for requests and responses and so forth. Um, so there was certainly that, but but the real reactive programming versus say interactive programming where you uh, sit and wait until that particular uh, you know, you request something and you're blocked until you do something else. That was, you know, the less ideal situation. You know, you click the submit button, nothing happens on your UI, you're completely locked up, what have you. Um, where it really has has kind of come to light, I would say, certainly is, is in the past couple of years, is we're starting to realize 
um, with promises, hey, we have the, this notion of a first class uh, future value. Uh, before we were dealing with callbacks and, and, and so forth, and where we would get back an error or, uh, or the actual value, and Node kind of made that uh, a thing. Uh, and then pr we realized, well, promises are a little bit better in that uh, we can get that value, we can chain it together, uh, instead of having to use the, the async module like everybody else and, and the grandmother was using. Uh, but that didn't really solve the problem for multiple values, as it were. And when people are dealing with multiple values, they deal with it all the time. And, you know, that's what events are for. Uh, and people kind of wanted a way to deal with events kind of the same way that they deal with arrays in, in JavaScript. In the ES5 time frame, they, add, they added what they called the, ES, uh, the ES5, uh, the array extras, as it were. And this is a, an idea of adding you know, map, filter, reduce, uh, sum, and every, and so forth to, to arrays. So now you have this sort of functional composition or this array composition that you never had before. So you could, uh, you could uh, do a, a map, then a filter, and then a reduce on, a, uh, on an array. Now, when people thought about this, and we, we started saying to them specifically, I, we have that very same concept, but instead of thinking about uh, you know dealing with uh, with uh, collections that's that are in memory and so forth, uh, think about it as collections over time. So your mouse movements are collections over time. Your uh, your button clicks are collections over time. Um, and so that's really started to kind of click with people. They're like, oh, well, that's kind of cool is the fact that now instead of having these callbacks like we do for, for event handlers, uh, you know, event targets and so forth, we now have this, this first class value just as we have for promises, but, but now we have it for events. So I can pass into you, for example, uh, a collection of mouse movements or a collection of stock ticks or whatever. It's a general push mechanism that I can just hand anybody uh, and it's great for composition. You can do all sorts of really, really interesting things with it. Um, and I, I, I think it started really hitting mainstream when, when I obviously started talking about it a bit, but, uh, but Netflix as well started really kind of uh, going out there and talking about how they're using it on uh, various uh, uh, various platforms, how they've kind of you know built bought into the whole reactive extensions uh, as a mantra. So all of their programmers, uh, regardless of, of, of language, whether they were Java, which is why they created RxJava, uh, .NET, JavaScript, and so forth, can agree upon a given language uh, in that, or that DSL as it were. And that DSL being the reactive extensions, now they've got pr programmers that understand this, this DSL or this language and they can now go across different platforms and that pretty much be able to be productive from day one because they understand the very concepts from one language to the other match entirely. So that that started to, to become kind of their their big thing as they go off and they do these tech talks and you know still to this day we see a lot of people linking to the original things by by Jafar Hussein uh, about some of the the original talks that he and I did together um, and so that's where I, I think it really started to pick up and then. Uh, further on down the line, you had uh, other other people looking at things like Angular uh, and saying, "Well, you know, this would fit, fit really nicely with Angular, or this would fit really nice with jQuery, and so forth." So we kind of found a, a niche, as it were, in the, in the Angular community because there were a lot of people like, "Wow, this is kind of cool," in the fact that you can. Uh, uh, do a lot of digest things. You can do a lot of safe applies. You can uh, also turn uh, uh, regular uh, callback things into uh, into observables as 
uh, or events as into observables and so forth. Uh, so it really kind of started to take off there. In so much so now that they're like, well, observables seem to be a pretty good thing and maybe it'll find a way into uh, the Rx contract will find a way into, into Angular 2. So that's kind of how it started to take off and then, then obviously the React uh, framework comes out and everyone realizes, oh crap, now we've got another thing that's ca uh, calling itself reactive. Um, and so people were starting to look at that as well and, and realizing that the two of them go fairly well together as well because you're dealing with, uh, with uh, with state models which are observables and you've got you know obviously rendering the state with with react components flux whatever so that's kind of a long-winded answer of how we kind of got here but I, I would say the majority of it is just the that the community has kind of taken off in its own right and found that uh, it wasn't me that was you know saying it's really good for this good for that it's it's these people that are creating some really compelling demos uh, some companies that are betting their their lives on it, as it were, whether it's uh, Microsoft or or Netflix or whomever, uh, you know, realizing that pretty much every single Netflix user interface uses RX to at some degree. So uh, it's battle tested. It's got some great ideas in there, and and it's got a lot of room to grow as well. So just to kind of back up a little bit. Um, a lot of people, when they're talking about reactive programming, they say to think of it as streams of events. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the question comes up, like, how is that the same as streams in Node? Is it safe to think of them as the same, or should we not be thinking of them as the same thing? Uh, you can certainly think of them as the same, but Node Node events are uh, Node streams are kind of interesting, um, and they're really uh, well optimized for binary data, obviously, and they're really good at, uh, for example, dealing with I'm going to read a file, I'm going to transform it, and then I'm going to write it, uh, pipe it back out. So it's a fairly linear path of pipe, 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 and so forth. Um, the dealing with, with objects, uh, even though it supports object mode, has never really been super optimized for, for that kind of operation. Um, certainly you can do transform, certainly you can do this and that with it, but it's fairly uh, uh, fairly overkill uh, for a lot of what you might want to do in terms of simple maps and filters and so forth. Uh, you could certainly build that on top of, of streams, but this is a... <clears throat> uh, most people build it completely independently uh, from uh, from that implementation, you know, from using the uh, uh, the observer, uh, the subject observer pattern, as it were, and so that's kind of where where it differs is the fact that you know it's uh, streams are built off of event emitters, which have pipe and all this back pressure mechanisms, and it's fairly unicast in nature. You have one producer and one consumer uh, at a time. Whereas in in uh, in reactive streams, you could fork that, you could uh, you could uh, window it, you could buffer it, you can do all, any number of little transforms with all of these combinators versus uh, just dealing with pipe directly. Okay, so and sure you can program one against the other, but I'm talking about it's completely independent thereof. <laughs> okay, so um, let me get this straight. It's like uh, mixing promises with streams with functions like the one you can find in Lodash, a map, or things like that, and doing everything yep. with just one model. Yeah. Yeah, Looks pretty much. Different. Yeah, I mean you can. Yeah, you can. Uh, you can. This. Yeah, you deal with uh, with these as as one uh, one distinct model, and it's kind of interesting to note. You know, when when we're talking about node streams. It's kind of interesting in the fact that the Dart language itself uh, modeled their I/O libraries directly off of RX, uh, which I found kind of interesting. In the, and so that they have maps and filters and so forth on their streams of data, so you can do a map and filter and so forth on 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 say reading uh, reading a file. 
Uh, and the, 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 the same applies to, uh, to listening for a mouse move event and so forth. So they kind of unified uh, the two together, whereas uh, node streams and, and that kind of doesn't. Uh, so it, it would have been nice to, to have the two kind of mix and match, but I just don't see it happening. All right, so what do you think, um, what do you think about BaconJS? About what now? Uh, BaconJS. It's like a, oh, bacon another... Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Okay. So they're uh, early on in the, uh, the Rx uh, days, before we were open source and taking contributions and so forth, there are a lot of, I would say, Sore spots in, in RX and the fact that there was there was not a lot of understanding about hot versus cold observables, uh, shared uh, shared side effects, um, and so forth. Uh, that so it was it was there there were certainly some WTF moments for some people that were just diving into it because, like I said at the time, it wasn't really documented all that well. So Yuha, uh, I, I love me. I'd love to be able to pronounce his name. Uh, he uh, he came in and created Bacon JS, but he took a lot of ideas from from RX, uh, and then he kind of married them with with things from Reactive Banana and so forth. Uh, so he really wanted to to kind of mimic FRP or functional reactive programming in terms of the separation of of behaviors and uh, uh, which have uh, behaviors which are are values over time versus discrete events which are uh, which are things such as mouse clicks and so forth which do not have a notion of a consistent or constant value. So he kind of wanted that break between the two versus us who never really made the distinction uh, between them. Uh, and there's there's certainly uh, valid reasons for for doing what he did uh, in terms of of uh, of making those distinctions in terms of what he calls uh, properties, you know, what we call behaviors uh, versus uh, versus that. And then the whole hot versus cold. I'm they uh, the bacon community and kefir and and others have kind of gone on 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 the um, other side of things, you know, onto the hot versus cold, where they would say, no, 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 everything's hot by default, because sometimes we're like, why am I suddenly getting all the values at once versus sometimes I'm caught in the middle or, or what have you. They didn't understand the, the temperature uh, issues that you can run into. And I, and I think we've documented those well uh, in between time, but you know, quite honestly, it, it's if you want to use it, you can go for it. Uh, we think that we have a pretty big community, pretty big adoption in terms of, of what we do, and I and I certainly don't want to speak bad about any other uh, libraries. They they do what they do fairly well. Uh, just our value proposition is is that you know that distinction between hot and cold and and shared and unshared uh, side effects are, are fairly important to us and to our users, uh, and we should, uh, you know, we should be, be fairly obvious about it. Okay. So, so yeah. that's kind of that's kind of my opinion. It is, is that you know we we have different approaches. Some work better for others, and and, and so forth. Uh, like I said, we we made a very distinct effort, for example, to to be you know jQuery, Big uh, Angular, uh, Ember, and so forth compliant in the fact that you can easily plug uh, in, things in and, and out of there, um, just as well as we have subjects. And and what really really distinguishes us from others is the fact that you know we have this notion of of these schedulers where we can tell where a computation happens, when it happens, and so forth. And other libraries, such as Bacon, don't have that. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that you, you said uh, a few things like um, Rx has been in development for like six plus years. It's really a tried and true. Um, I mm -hmm. even heard that kind of like the, the enterprise version that you would choose. Um, and uh, 
so, so Jeff Wellkley and I, we created a survey to uh, ask uh, Angular developers, like, what kind of data-related libraries they would use for Angular 2 when switching. Mm -hmm. And ArcGIS was high at the top, um, like the most popular out of everything on the list. So I think that it really right. shows how the community is really adopting uh, ArcGIS. It is. Um, it, it is. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, like you, yeah. you even see like yeah, you even see like libraries like uh, Falcor JS, which is truly like adopting RxJS and uh, it's another mm -hmm. approach of like how to manage your API endpoints. Like that's um, yeah, that's like really important. like what do you what are your thoughts on the community just like like going crazy and like creating like different variations um, like Rx Java for example from yeah. Netflix and just everyone just um, just running uh, running with this. Yeah, it, it's great. I mean, I, I look, uh, I I look pretty much every week just to see what's what's uh, you know what's taking a dependency on RX in in npm. And it's actually fairly interesting just to see what people are, are doing with it, whether they're creating these routers, whether they're creating uh, these you know web socket handlers, file system utilities, whatever it is. Um, in so much so that you know I've, I found out the hard way you know during some botched. Uh, NPM uh, uh, updates uh, for RX so that uh, I, I you know it's running back uh, the the search aspects for Bower so I'm like oops uh, <laughs> it wasn't any of my fault we, we hopefully NPM has figured that problem out but uh, but yeah it, it's very interesting to to see what people are are using it for and so forth and even in the in the Gitter channel that we have I just see these new things I'm like holy what are these people doing with this is is, is really really amazing um, so I, I'm really heartened by it. we have a, a ton of community examples out there I mean we we were very specific when we were creating this we have to ship examples of people using this or else they're never going to get it and so above and beyond that I, I see them every single uh, you know I see a lot of these every single day and I add them to we add them to our community page of, of examples of, of people using X technology and RX together and then yeah and then when when you're seeing it across different languages such as now there's RX Swift which has been added to the uh, the what we call the RX family as it were uh, that's kind of cool as well. Is is that they took a uh, unlike uh, reactive cocoa, which kind of deviated a little bit in terms of especially the hot versus cold and so forth. Uh, Rx Swift is kind of a a you know a tried and true implementation of of Rx and so forth. Uh, so it's really really cool. We have an Rx Rust that we're we're getting off of the ground. And and in, in addition, what's kind of cool is the fact that uh, you know going on RX V next next as it were because I'm I'm currently working on, uh, we're currently working on four um, from five on forward uh, we're actually uh, completely redoing uh, the worlds uh, so if you go to ReactiveX slash RXJS what you'll find there is uh, is that we have groups from you know from from Google, from Netflix, from Microsoft, all all combining together uh, to say what what would an ideal version of RX? Because obviously, there you know out over those five six years, we have some technical debt that we'd like to pay down. What would that ideal be? And so to to have the community itself be really involved uh, from the ground up again is really really exciting to, to see. So I'm I'm. I'm really happy for it in the fact that uh, we can we can kind of wipe the slate clean in, in certain aspects, still get the same behavior, get a lot better performance, and you know better modularity and 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 so forth. And yes, be uh, a, a default part of of uh, of Angular and hopefully uh, you know things like React as well. So and then going further, obviously to ES observables. So speaking of the ES observables, how much of Rx has influenced that, and will R or RxJS will RxJS still be a thing if that spec is approved? Or oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, right now it's a little bit in flux. Um, 
I I was with uh, Jafar in that last on the last TC39 meeting when we were discussing uh, you know kind of the the design as it were of of what uh, of what observables should look like and it's and it's not dramatically changed they they had an original proposal way back when uh, you know of kind of uh, flipping the the generator on its head. Uh, and then making it kind of an async generator, and that's kind of gone out the window now because there are a lot of things that they just couldn't do uh, properly. So now what we're doing is is we're looking at uh, the ideas of of more of a observable observable, and yeah, absolutely, it's it's based upon every single little thing that we've done with RX and what's worked and what hasn't, and you know, trying to define. Uh, the 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 concepts in very concrete language because remember all the browsers and all the runtimes are going to have to implement this if it gets approved uh, and that, that's that's the big if but um, but its design is very very true to what we have now so would ArcJS still be a thing if that did get approved or oh, would you think they would all I would I would find it hard to be, hard to uh, you know hard to, to to believe that you know just just as you know array uh, array arrays are getting more value uh, more things attached to them in ES5 ES6 ES7 that's never made Lodash go away uh, and in fact it, it became even bigger and greater is because they're like oh geez I can do this with uh, with arrays now I want to do X Y and Z. Uh, and there are a lot of things that, that you know that may be time related, maybe schedule related that we want to just add to observables after the fact. So if we just treat it as a building block, just as you know people are doing with promises nowadays of just extending them even further, subclassing them, what have you, uh, I, I think you'll find that actually it has even a bigger role than it does now. And also it will be cross brothers. Because it's cross, way yes, for, uh, yeah. observables. I mean, I, 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 yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, I've already made sure that it's as cross browser uh, as as you know as possible. Meaning, I fix events all the way back to IE five five. But uh, but yes, yeah. Just the the idea is, yeah, it's there. It's in your browser. It's 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 something that you can just build upon. Just like promise, you can just build upon it, add new things to it. Uh, Etc. Wrap it, as it were. Yeah. So you um, you mentioned hot versus cold uh, observables, and mm -hmm. I keep hearing like a lot of people talk about it, but no one really like they talk um, about it being a thing, but no one actually explains it like on video or anything. Um, do you mind uh, uh, tackling? Sure. That? Um, I, I think actually did uh, did Andre uh, Andre Matsaros do a video of that? I believe he might have for Egghead Radio. If he didn't, uh, I'll I'll refresh everyone's memory. Anyways, uh, so the idea between a hot and cold observable is is that, and, and it's a great analogy that we we, we thought of, which is you know, think of of a cold observable as a movie, and the movie you will see the same. Thing time and time and time again, and you can always rewind it, go back to the beginning, and you know, you'll always get the same uh, the same result. And the same thing applies to an you know if you're if you're taking an array, you're taking a range, whatever it is. Every time you subscribe to it, and everybody else subsequently who subscribes to it will get the same answer. For example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I hand it so this the observable to somebody else. They get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Great. So that's what it's a consistent. Cold is a constantly consistent answer at uh, at kind of a. You will always get that kind of relative to to where you are in 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 the time frame. A hot observable is is strictly based on on absolute time. In the going forward, I could subscribe late to a. Uh, to us to a to a stream of of mouse movements, so I do observable from events mouse movements. Okay, now if I subscribe to it five seconds later, I'm not going to see that 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 difference between when I when I said from event and when I said sub, sub, subscribe. Those are gone. 
And like I said, those were things were happening in absolute time, and they're gone. They're history. I'm never going to get that same answer uh, ever again. Uh, so that's kind of the huge difference is that you know, hot values keep on moving regardless of whether you're listening to it or not. And so, yeah, sometimes you can miss values. Values are dropped on the floor, and it's just something that you just have to deal with. Uh, you know, there are certain mitigating things that you can do to, you know, recover from that. But quite honestly, would you? If if you just want to pass around these sorts of, you know, comp, compo, composite events, and you know, eventually subscribe to it, you don't necessarily want the entire history of the world being shoved into you. Uh, versus just like oh, right now is good enough, and uh, and I'll get that particular value. So it's kind of like that movie versus a play. You might get a different, you know, you you see the play. It's the same general concept, but you know, slightly you might have a different cast. You might say there are lines differently, what have you. There's that there's that difference between that movie, which is set in stone, and that play, which is seen live. Interesting. If that makes any sense. If, it did, yeah. if you want me to go further, I can go further. No, it's okay. I think if I get it, I'm sure Patrick will understand it even more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, just the, the, the basic thing is, is that, yeah, a cold observable, you'll get always the same answer every single time I ask you. The, the hot observable won't. And it will say, well, at this particular time, this is the value. Um, how does it work with test? Because I think that one really good value of um, reactive programming is uh, that uh, testing is easy and yeah, easy to do. I think. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we made that very specific in the design of RX uh, from the very beginning. We had uh, kind of the, the, these three pillars that RX is built off of. The first one being uh, the the observer and the observable uh, being the the, cons uh, the producer and the consumer. Uh, the second part was adding a lot on all of these extras or operators of the maps, filters, uh, takes, skips, and what have you. Uh, and then the third pillar was the, the 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 scheduler. This notion that we could base all our entire library on uh, a notion of discrete virtual time. So that means we can capture every little thing that happens along the way and replay it back to you and say, hey, by the way, this happened. And so the, this notion of schedulers is the fact that now uh, for a particular uh, thing, I can swap out, like for example, if I'm doing animation, I can say use the request animation frame scheduler versus use the immediate scheduler or use something else. Uh, but where it's most interesting is is, is obviously in, in testing, as you said before, which was the idea that I could, uh, uh, for example, create a uh, create an observable with values to fire at X time. I'm going to map it. Uh, you know, uh, inside the uh, inside, I'm going to map this particular uh, th this particular sequence to something else, and then I'm going to run it. And then I'm going to look at the values, so I can I can see what the value is and what time it happened, and I can see when you subscribed and when you unsubscribed. That you know that is one of the true you know value propositions of, of RX is the fact that you get repeatable values, even though you know I could say uh, it's really going to happen on next Tuesday. Well, I can verify that through the through the test scheduler that it sure enough is going to happen on next Tuesday. Uh, regardless of whether I have to go out for you know a good long week, let my browser sit there for for a week and, and test that, I don't have to. Is because the the notion is that scheduler this this abstraction takes care of that for me, and all of our tests are written that way. So all of them are very deterministic, and we think fairly clean in terms of how they look. But that's subjective. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Um, so, uh, since we're an Angular podcast, uh, how does RxJS work with Angular, and is it easy to integrate? Um, oh. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The with 
I I've been doing Angular, gosh, since uh, pre one oh maybe uh, something like that. But when uh, when RX really started to get some sort of you know traction was was certainly in the one uh, one dot oh one 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 two time frame. So. Uh, what we decided to do was say, okay, there are, there are certain pain points that people have, obviously, with, with, with Angular, what they would like to do. Uh, what they would like to do is, is like, for example, convert the, their HTTP stuff uh, to observables in so, in so much so that you could, so for example, I could retry it three times, I can uh, catch an error and then, you know, just catch an error and return I can do any number of things with uh, with uh, the uh, with the factory or or service layer, um, but j just as well we could also you know declaratively uh, do things like an autocomplete where you can take this one particular uh, this one particular scoped value and debounce it by say a half second, a second, something like that. So if you're doing an autocomplete, you can automatically debounce that value so that you're getting um, only when they stop typing for, for, for a second or so and then it's, it's uh, uh, and, and then it kind of kind of works out nicely uh, that way. There are a number of, of of ways of people just being able to you know, safe apply during uh, during a particular function. There's any number of these really good in uh, these really kind of interesting and, and good uh, entry points for for Angular and RX. And since Angular is fairly event driven internally with scopes and watches and so forth, it just kind of makes sense that that a push based framework such as as RX kind of works that way. With yeah, them. so it's, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, autocomplete because that's that's pretty much where I discovered RxJS was a Angular mm -hmm. example where someone actually used RxJS, and I looked at the code. Yep. I was like, "Well, how is that so like easy? What what makes it so like?" Simple. Then I just for RX and then I just covered all your docs and I'm like, oh my god, it's amazing. And then like I showed it to my friend and then he's like, oh my god, it's amazing. And then we created like a <laughs> like a, a Node version uh, server that uses RX and then you're just yeah. trying that out. Uh, and then like uh, that's where like, RX is really really awesome just because of like managing events and like, especially all the yeah. complete um, like those kind of things. Yeah. Like you could look at the callback examples. You could try to make it. Like work, but it's just so it's so easy um, to do with RX. Like that's like that's one of the, the most powerful things with um, with RX and and it is. with Agile. Yeah. And the, yeah, yeah, it is. And, and the reason why it is is because yes, you have your state basically throwing uh, flowing throughout the computation. Why it's important in, in autocomplete, for example, is obviously the the debouncing logic as well as you know checking whether values have changed because you're you know doing left and right arrows for example if you're just doing key up detection but obviously that's not the case in in angular uh, those are not distinct values just by the very nature of the, the text not changing but the the other aspects of being able to then call a service and make sure that those service operations come in order is absolutely essential and the fact that I've been on my phone too many times on my like typing typing and the wrong answer comes because the the, the responses came out of order uh, and that's a problem obviously and, and unfortunately you know plain old promises don't have a, a good mechanism to do that whereas uh, observables if your entire stream is an observable we can do all a lot of that cancellation and all that directly for you, so to make sure that you only have the latest and freshest data. And that's why it makes really, really compelling is you can just do it literally in about ten lines of code. So you kind of already talked about a couple examples, but I'm just really curious to hear more concrete examples of how people are using this. Um, you know, I was kind of I. I didn't play around with Rx. I was actually kind of looking around at the observable spec, and it seems mm -hmm. like a great way to kind of make your code a little bit easier to reason about. But still, like, mm -hmm. I hear a lot of people talking theory, and I would like to see more concrete examples. Okay. Well, let's let's take another kind of example that has 
to do with, with creating uh, you know, very responsive UIs. Let's say we have uh, an iPad, iPhone, something like that that's fairly memory constrained, and we have this UI, as it were. Here, I'll just take a phone just to, just to make it a little bit more uh, concrete for you. But what you want to do is you want to make sure that whatever is on the screen is in memory. As soon as it goes and I'm swiping out of it, it goes out of memory. How do you do that? So without a lot of this, this wicked state hanging around, how would you do that? Well, what you could do is you could uh, listen for uh, you know scroll uh, you know document scroll events, and then you can basically uh, as you're uh, as you're creating these rows determine uh, through an interval, basically asking uh, asking every ten milliseconds, are you in scope or not? Uh, you know if if that row is no longer visible, destroy it. Uh, so you can keep on uh, asking, 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 are you visible or are you not? And you're going to add a little bit of a debounce because if I go back and, like I said, I do like this like really quickly, I don't want to unload and reload all of this data just because I was really being stupid and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, just not make, being able to make up my mind. Uh, but once that goes at when I go, you know, flip, and it just sits there, and I just goes, ah, oh, okay, you've really flipped to a new area. I can then deterministically get rid of those rows. I can clean up all of their event handlers and anything else that I need to do, uh, based upon the fact that, and now I can obviously uh, load these new rows. And in these new rows, I do the same logic to. I don't know if that makes any sense, but the idea is that you're trying to only keep in memory what you have on your screen, and with these events of the document scrolls and and the determine uh, and the positioning basically of the rows, uh, you can determine whether to load or unload data. That helps. Okay, I mean there are there are lots of other examples, obviously, especially with with data querying, but uh, but for for UI. Ex it, it makes a lot more sense to say, okay, uh, I when I you know like a, a, a to do list, uh, the, these kinds of things can all be an observable stream that I can listen to, add, add and edit and cancel and so forth. Uh, but the the really complex answers sometimes bear the most fruit because like, how would I do that without observables? You know, because I have to remember, I have to tear down every single little row. How would I do that? It would be pretty nasty. So, yeah, so, so that's it, it, it's funny. it's the more it's the more complicated scenarios that make it more interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like um, we are, we're covering is uh, the infinite scroll uh, problem. There's also like drag yep. drop problem. There's also like uh, forms and like uh, error messages. Like having because like you type in something and suddenly it's, there's an error. Like how do you like manage all that? So like that's a, a few more examples. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, is how do you? Yeah, exactly. Errors, uh, error states. Because what you're doing is you're creating these fairly complex state machines, and where do these errors go? Mm. Uh, but if we have a single error channel that flows throughout, then it becomes a lot easier to say, oh well, all these all these failures are going to then go to a specific channel, and we're good. You know, based upon some scripting. So, yeah, absolutely. The deterministic um, thing to know that it's going to be constructed and deconstructed in a certain way is also very nice for for dealing with performance. For example, to know that uh, these event handlers are now gone because uh, because I called dispose, and so all my memory resources are, have been recovered. Yep. Really, really amazing stuff that you can do with this. <laughs> I think I will try um, when I have the time. Um, so we're coming to the end of the show. I don't see any question on Twitter. Um, Patrick and Amy, if you have any last, last question to ask, it's the time, or we will go to Pix. No question. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, is that boring? <laughs> <laughs> I just have a hard stop in a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's just let's just go through the picks. Yeah. 
Um, Matthew, if you have to add something before we we talk about picks. Uh, well, uh, like I said, is the uh, is the the future of RX is 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 fairly bright in terms of uh, in terms of obviously the ES uh, the ES spec observable as well as uh, just the, the library in general how it's evolving and and uh, evolving and shaping itself over time I think is is really really amazing where it's finding its place in in flux architectures where it's finding its place. In Angular 2 and, and and so forth, I think it's really kind of cool. Okay, um, so let's start with picks. Um, uh, Amy, do you have any picks for this week? Sure, my pick this week again is going to be uh, Angular Remote Comp. I think today is the last day if you want to get the early bird special. So you can get the early bird special if you use uh, the promo code Angular Air, all one word for 20% off, and then you also get the discounted early bird rate. So the last day for that is today. Otherwise, you can only get the 20% off, which I'll keep announcing. So that is my pick for this week. Thank you. Um, Patrick? Yeah, so I have two picks. Um, one is um, gitcloak.com. It's essentially a, a VPN, like one-click button for VPN. So if you're ever at a coffee shop or something, it's always good to make sure that no one else is like hacking your computer. Um, it's a really awesome service. My other, my other pick is a TV series called Mr. Robot. It's about a, a hacker. It actually depicts a like hacker like really well. Um, they have a, a lot of great attention to detail. Like pretty much everything they show, like it's like legitimate. Um, and uh, my tip is to commit to open source every single day, um, even if you have to create your own library or something. Uh, who cares if it's smaller, uh, mediocre? Uh, you'll be surprised. But uh, community open source every single day—that's always a, a good goal. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and finally, Matthew, do you have any pixel tips? Oh, picks. Well, let's see. Uh, I could uh, I could pick one of my own uh, own projects in the fact of the uh, uh, the Tali project, which uh, is another one of my projects, which is the idea that we can take uh, and have a, basically a secure P two P platform that can synchronize over Bluetooth, Wi Fi, what have you. So you don't even need cell phone service. You don't need uh, you, you don't need an internet. Uh, you don't need a Wi Fi connection. You can just synchronize your data and really own your data back and forth. So we have it running on iOS and Android right now, and uh, it's 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 a pretty promising app of bringing back you know peer to peer applications. Nice. So tallyproject.org. <laughs> and tips. Uh, uh, I would like to echo the uh, the commit to open source. Um, that that is actually one of the metrics that we're we're. Uh, kind of uh, that we're uh, you know looking at especially is is you know how people are, are committing to open source. But uh, any time I see people you know just committing the littlest things to to RxJS to even in terms of documentation fixes, I love it. There there's not there's no greater feeling than when people care that much about a misspelled word. I just love it, and and, and they learn so much over time. I just I yeah I wish more people would just be unafraid to to come and dip their their toes in the water, uh you know make sure you commit to projects that have good codes of conduct make sure they have good you know good community in terms of 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 how how well they treat their their members and so forth but uh that's when you re and and a pretty good com uh, contributing guidelines like we have. Is that you know once you dip your toe and you'll find that we're a fairly friendly community and and we would definitely love to have people so find those kinds of communities where they have you know codes of conduct where they really make you feel welcome and dive in. <laughs> Kent is gonna love that. Um, we will yeah. I really like uh, the way that Microsoft is open sourcing a lot of the stuff lately. So yeah. Yep. Work for open source. Yeah, and, no, it, yep. it's been fascinating to watch for sure. <laughs> and so for me, I don't really have anything because I was away for three weeks. I was in Bali, and I'm still like 
two weeks late on my news, so um, I think I'm gonna pass this week. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't have to be programming related. <laughs> Your pick yeah. could be vacation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> vacation. I don't know. Exactly. You look very relaxed. Restaurants, uh, hotels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so to wrap this up, um, maybe Matthew, if you could summarize reactive programming in one sentence, uh, like a uh, too long didn't read, <laughs> how would you do it? Uh, reactive programming in one sentence. I uh, easily re, re uh, easily uh, res responding to uh, to events. Okay. Uh, in a composable fashion. Ah. Okay. <laughs> that was. <laughs> Thank that, you. That, that, was a, that was a quick answer off the top of my head. No, it's okay. Uh, well, um, I think we are good. Uh, goodbye, everybody, and see you next week for yeah. UI Router. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you.